From years of anxiety to warrior and mentor, Bradley Robinson created the Anxiety Project to help you end your anxiety naturally. Let's mold the new you and let's end anxiety together. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Anxiety Project Podcast. We're rolling into 2024 on episode 270, talking about the foods to avoid this year. And now that we're entering this new year, what do we need to throw away? And you will realize once you throw these foods away that not only am I going to leave these foods away from my kitchen in 2024, but forever because of how you feel. And that's exactly how I feel after eliminating these foods about six years ago when I decided to make a radical change in what I was eating. I mean, radical change. 97% of what I was consuming every day needed to go. And that's a really hard thing to acknowledge and really shift in one's lifestyle because much of who you are, what, what you believe to be true, had to burn away. And I'm not coming from a place of bias that, you know, I always wanted to stick to meat. I was actually eating a lot of vegetables and a little bit of meat here and there, a little bit of chicken here and there. But I really believed, I believed that vegetables and berries and grains and all of this stuff and having a wide variety of foods is really important for human health. But then I realized based off of how I was feeling, this is not for me. And then I looked more into what other people were doing to that, what other people were doing to really radically change their mental and physical states. And then I started to follow them and experiment by elimination. And then my eyes widened to how I was, you know, how I was feeling. I mean, by cutting out, by cutting out grains and sugars and certain vegetable oils, man, things changed big time. So while you're listening to this podcast, if you're at home, please go into your cupboards, throw these damn foods away because really they're not doing you any good whatsoever. And I hope that this episode inspires you to, well, look at the food labels when you walk into supermarkets, because much of the aisles, 99% of the aisles in a Walmart are doing you no good whatsoever and is harming your health because obesity, diabetes, all sorts of autoimmune problems are on the rise more than ever before in human history. If you look at the photos of people back in the 50s, they are all slim. There was rarely an overweight person. Now when you walk down the street, one in three, one in five people is overweight clearly with their stomachs hanging out and the rolls on their sides and you know the double chins and it's just... I can't believe it. I walk down the street. I'm like, why is everybody so overweight? It is, it is beyond me. I can't even believe it. But we have to look at the details because the devil is always in the details. So the big food, number one, the big food to avoid is vegetable oils. Vegetable oils like Crisco, Back in, oh man, I can't remember how, but I know vegetable oils was introduced in 1911. So think about that. Not too long ago, this food was introduced into the public sphere created by humans. Already that's a red flag because it's created by humans. It hasn't been in the human diet for much of existence. So the body, why wouldn't the body treat that as a foreign object? And why wouldn't that cause problems? Which later we now know does to an unbelievable degree. So how is vegetable oils like canola oil, like rapeseed oil, sunflower oil, and just even vegetable oil, right? You look at the back of a mayonnaise container and it's vegetable oil, sunflower oil, cookies made with sunflower oil, crackers, cakes, breads, everything. I mean, 
It's in be frozen beef patties. It's in almost everything. I go into Walmart and I'm like, oh my God, this must be good for me. And I look at the back and it's like first ingredient, vegetable oil. I even find it in some vitamins. They put vegetable oil and it just baffles me. It's like, it's in everything. First of all, why? Well, it's highly addictive. That's why. If people know this. That's why they put them in the most uh, like random food items. So why would they put that in there? It's addictive. You go to McDonald's, your french fries are deep fried in vegetable oils. And you're, you know, why don't you go back periodically? There's something highly addictive about them. So how is vegetable oils made? It begins with a rape seed. It begins with a seed from a rape plant, which, it, which are toxic in and of itself. And in order to make the oil, the seed must be bred to lower the levels of er, erucic acid, which is a, it, it is a, 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 a unsaturated, polyunsaturated omega-9, I believe fatty acid and it's a top well it basically it's a toxic toxic fatty acid that causes heart lesions okay so this is in the seeds that they are compressing to make the oil out of and then the seeds are ground at extremely high temperatures to extract the oil which is oxidated due to the process and the the oil is then washed with a solvent called hexane it is a known neurological toxin and hexane oh man once you dive into hexane you just can't even believe that is in your food and it's easily absorbed through the skin and th just through it being inhaled just you by ingesting it and it has been recognized for more than 40 years that hexane causes long-term nerve damage to your limbs, to the hands, arms, legs, your feet, not to mention other harmful effects in the body, including inflammation, all sorts of inflammation, right? So that's in the canola oil, by the way, that you're consuming. And it's then followed by bleaching, and deodorization to reduce its already rancid smell because it absolutely stinks, right? So imagine going into a factory and, you know, it, there's no way in, ever in human history where a human being went out into the fields, took a seed, and was able to extract oil from it, right? Because you can't do that. You shouldn't even be ingesting seeds in general. They're, they're just toxic for the body. But some human being was able to make these machines and use chemicals to extract the, this oil from these seeds through this long, demanding process. And in the end, the oil not only contains these harmful solvents, but is loaded with trans fatty acids. And these trans fats is known to produce cancer and much of the autoimmune problems that are running rampant, including weight gain. This is known fact. And rats that are fed vegetable oils gained weight rapidly and they developed cancer. And so why are these oils so widely used? Why do people use them if they're so, for the, this bad? And first of all, my, my answer is, simple one, is a simple one. Why would you trust in culture that they're looking out for your best interest? That's one. Why would you trust in the central narrative? Okay? And then the second thing is, it's cheap. That's why it's in pretty much everything. It's really cheap. And it has a long shelf life. So the foods can stay on the shelf for a very long time. That's great because you can't leave beef, you know, on the shelf for a long time. It goes rancid quick, eggs rancid quick, and dairy rancid quick, like cheeses and stuff. Well, these are real foods. Even leafy greens 
can't leave them out for a long time. They just shrivel up very quickly. Salad. You leave a salad in the fridge and it goes bad in like a day or two, right? But with cookies and crackers and cakes and all of these weird concoctions you find in Costco or Walmart, they're in your cupboard like a cereal and you can eat that pretty much like a month later, right? I know cereals can go bad, but if you leave them sealed, not, not really. No, you can leave them in the box on the shelf for a long time. And the reason culture continues to promote this oil as heart healthy, which you see on margarines, for example, which are absolutely detrimental for your health in all possible way. It is, it's just unbelievable. The reason why they promote this as heart healthy is that their biased fueled studies consistently link polyunsaturated fat to a reduced risk of heart problems compared with saturated fat. Like that's the underlying narrative. And But this has already been proven to be 100% false. But why do they continue this narrative if it is false? Well, ever since Ansel Keys did his seven country studies back in the 50s, where he cherry-picked his findings, by the way, because he was the type of guy who didn't want to be proven wrong. He wanted to be proven right. He was given loads of money to do all of these studies, and he was getting attention. And while he was getting this attention, he wanted to stick to what he fundamentally believed because people around him were starting to support him and, and trust in him. And if he were to come out and say, well, you know what? I don't think my studies are viable. I don't think they hold up. Well, you know, people would lose their trust in him. He wouldn't get the money and the funding he was currently getting, and also he was just that guy who just wanted to win. He was a one-sided figure. He didn't look at all the sides to the coin, both sides of the coin. So the narrative continued to be in, in the nutrition guidelines as, well, fat is unhealthy and it's causing heart disease. But what was really causing, what is really causing heart disease is all the complex carbohydrates, the, the, polyunsaturated fatty acids. That's what's really causing heart disease because many of the doctors I follow, they only eat meat in their diet. There's studies coming out like this all the time and their calcium score, which measures uh, how much plaque is in their arteries, is zero. So think about that. They're eating in their diet, they're eating 90% or what, not 90%, 70% fat, you know, 30% protein every day, and their calcium score is zero, they're not developing any plaque in their arteries. Why? I thought fat was deemed as evil, the devil. Well, no, it's not. And that's what we're finding out today, that you should be eating butter. You should be eating beef tallow with your meals. You should be eating bacon, eggs, This is what's fundamental for human health. And we're finding now that the cholesterol in these fatty foods is important for your health because our cells are made up of cholesterol and fat, our brain especially. Because 70% of our brain, I believe, is fat. And I noticed that switching to more fatty foods like fatty fish, beef, eggs, I've noticed that my cognitive processing is sharper I'm able to retain information. I'm more calmer in my emotions, more stable. Maggie saw this and then she changed her diet years ago. And then she just recently, she eats mostly meat. Recently, months ago, she went to her doctors to get a checkup and all of her levels were, were great. All her vitamins were there. She only eats meat and her health is in pristine condition. So how, how do you explain that? Right, And I originally jumped on this diet because of Jordan Peterson six years ago. I was just, I didn't have a bias towards meat. I wasn't looking, I got to eat meat in my diet. Quite the contrary. I always had this notion that meat was bad, butter, all of this was bad. But I listened to Peterson. He was suffering from 
weight gain. He was suffering from autoimmune problems. He was really having a hard, tough time with gum disease. A um, lot of problems, lots and lots of problems. But he was on Rogan and he said that meat changed his life. All of his autoimmune problems went away. He lost weight. He was sleeping better. His cognitive ability was way better, sharper, and everything just seemed to improve. And that shifted my perspective over everything I've been told about diet, everything. And then Rogan talks about meat only diets. Dr. Sean Baker is now public with meat only diet. Uh, Dr. Barry, Dr. Paul Saladino, uh, Michelle Hearn. So many doctors now are now expressing their insights towards this new way of eating. It's really remarkable. And I highly recommend you start to explore just this spectrum of eating, including animal foods in your diet, because it really changes everything. And I saw that shift within me because I was eating a lot of pasta and pizzas regularly, Chinese food here, McDonald's here and there, you know, sugary coffee. Um, I was just eating the standard American diet, but I really wanted to make a change when I realized how bad I was feeling after I was eating pasta. Because I would tell Maggie, oh, I just feel, you know, she would see in me, I'd get these mood swings, I'd get cranky, I'd get hangry. I would just be never satisfied, never satiated. I was just having a rough time of it. And, you know, also autoimmune problems, waking up, feeling drained, a lot of that. So, you know, the reason the culture continues to refuse new data on these studies, it's pretty obvious once you look into it. It's really obvious. But first is that they they have to admit that they were wrong in the past. All those decades of telling the public, you have to eat this way, it's healthy, you have to avoid beef and eggs, it's going to cause problems. It's like, well, I have to, you have to admit that most of, most of your career, you know, you were wrong and you made a mistake and God, they don't want to do that. But also it gets even more interesting. They get paid and they get sponsored by big food corporations like Kellogg's. Much of the studies that you see on national television saying, well, meat is bad. Meat's causing this. You should eat a vegan based diet. Look at the studies. Look who's funding the studies. If you take it at face value, you are missing the meat of it. You're missing the snakes embedded within the studies. Kellogg's funds a lot of studies. Big food corporations fund these studies. And then Big Pharma funds much of these studies as well. Big Pharma pays a lot of doctors to promote their medications. Not to tell their patients, hey, maybe you should shift this because doctors really don't know little about diet because in medical school, they're not trained into the nutritional side of things. They're trained more technically in you know cells and how the body functions and medications to treat certain illnesses but they're not learning nutrition. And so when you go to your doctor and you trust in your doctor and they say, oh, your blood pressure is high. What are you eating? Beef? You should cut that out. It's like, where are you getting this information from? Medical school? Yo, yeah, that's exactly where they're getting their medication from. They are ignorant in that. Trust me on this. But you don't have to trust me. I can give you some books. You just dive into it on your own. You know, it doesn't matter if you don't trust me or not. Dive into it. I have many resources to give to you, and I will give them to you by the end of this episode. So don't trust in the universal narrative. Find out from individuals who radically shifted their health, who look good. They look good. They, they've improved autoimmune problems. And just, it's a leap of faith. That's really what it is. But it starts by eliminating foods and start by eliminating vegetable oils and substitute that with maybe coconut oil, but most importantly, butter, ghee, 
beef tallow, those kinds of fats. Then the next food to avoid is sugar. Sugar is obvious, and these points are going to seem obvious to you, but sugar is linked to increase in anxiety and depression. It's linked to mood swings, insulin spikes leading to tiredness and crashing, you know, that crash by like 1 p.m. that you need a double-double coffee to get you back up. And you're continuously unsatiated. So more cravings, which leads to overindulging. And sugar is universally known now. It's linked to weight gain, diabetes, cancer. It weakens immune health overall. So headaches, stiff joints, tooth decay, psoriasis, shortness of breath, foggy mind, and heart disease. Pretty obvious, but man, sugar is unbelievably harmful for the body. Soy, soy is the next food to avoid. So when we talked about vegetable oils, we talked about sugars, and the last one we're diving into is soy. It's high in phytic acid, which inhibits mineral absorption. Such minerals include calcium, magnesium, copper, iron, zinc. Soy flour and protein isolates should be avoided because they do the same thing. They're found in protein shakes, bars, meat substitutes, low-carb breads. It interferes with protein digestion because soy is high in anti-nutrients, which compromises digestive enzymes. Interesting. Another anti-nutrient in soy is goitrogens. Goitrogens, which is G-O-I-T-R-O-G-E-N-S. This interferes with the absorption of iodine important for thyroid function. And lastly, pesticides, this residue is it remains in soy, just like the pesticides in peanut butter. The the pesticides are absorbed into the peanuts themselves through the shells. When they spray the peanuts with the shells on, it goes through the shells and the peanuts. That's why if you're ever going to eat peanut butter, you buy the organic ones, that um, pesticide-free organic peanut butter. The really expensive peanut butter, that's what you need to buy because those pesticides are in the natural ones. And if you look at the natural peanut butters down the Walmart aisle, they're filled with vegetable oils, right? You want to get the peanut butter that are just peanuts, if anything. Man, it just drives me nuts that how crazy the foods have become now. And like, just look around you. No wonder everyone's so unhealthy these days. And big pharma is just sitting back with their cigars and watching the money pile up, 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 up. Because there's no profit for them in promoting a meat-only diet or a ketogenic, low-carb, whole foods diet. Why would they ever do that? They're going to lose money. Big food corporations, Kellogg's, going to lose money. You go walk down the cereal aisle and you see Cheerios being promoted as heart healthy. There's nothing about Cheerios that is healthy for you. Nothing about Cheerios. Read the ingredients. It has like 50 ingredients, probably more. It's a giant paragraph of ingredients. If you see a giant paragraph of ingredients on a food product, that means it's not good for you. 100%. 100%. It's not good for you. So what's the spectrum of keto? We talked about these three major foods also. Low-carb, breads. We, it's obvious that breads cause a lot of leaky gut, a lot of autoimmune problems, a lot of neurological issues, right? Bread is obvious. You shouldn't be eating any kinds of bread, right? If you're transitioning from a high-carb diet into keto, yeah, you can transition with low-carb breads, like almond flour-type breads, but I wouldn't stick with those breads in the long run because those aren't your best friend either but it can help you transition which i used 
six years ago in my transition period, I've, I, I ate a lot of keto bars and shakes and things like that. But in the end, it was causing me bloating problems and things like that. And I eliminated those and it really helped. You know, I just, I just stick to low, low, low carb, uh, whole foods right now. And so when you transition, you can, you can grab onto these keto fads in the store, but keep in mind that your best friends are whole foods. Think of how our ancestors survived over the millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years. What have we eaten? We've mostly hunted. Meat was the backbone of our evolution. There's a great book, Catching Fire, by Richard Rangham. I love this book. And he's not a dietitian, but he observed that we established fire almost 2 million years ago, right? And we've been cooking food ever since 2 million years ago. That's insane. Okay. And then how do we survive? How does one survive in this chaotic nature that we currently inhabit? Well, meat is the backbone. Organ meats, hunting and killing animals was a very sacred thing. And so we ate meats and we also ate vegetables. We ate things like potatoes and we, we ate carbs to some extent, but meat was, has always been the backbone. So why, if we've evolved around eating meat, it shaped us because we then traded guts for brains, right? Because think of a barreled gorilla. They eat leaves for like 13 hours a day because there's no caloric nutrition found in leaves. But when we started to eat meat and cook the meat, Specifically, what happened is our guts started to shrink and our brains started to develop and our face, faces have changed and evolved around eating meat, around eating meat. There was this guy, I can't remember his name, back in the, man, the early 1900s. And he went to, he went to visit the Inuit people. And he was curious. He was from America and he was curious about the Inuit and how they lived. And he went there and he, he observed that these people ate meat, only meat, all year long. And not only were they doing well, but they were thriving. They were thriving. And he was just blown away. He couldn't believe it. So he went back to America and then he went on an only meat diet for a year. And he's like, man, this is going to surely kill me. This is going to surely kill me because I'm going against the narrative of the Western culture. It's going to kill me. But then a year later, what he discovered is that he thrived on a meat-only diet. All of his, his health improved significantly. He felt great. And he was just blown away by this. And I think we're now coming to see that we're, you know, and especially nowadays through YouTube and through the public figures we see, that meat is really important for human health, right? I saw this 80-year-old woman. She ate meat most, most of her life, and she looked so good. She looked 20 years younger than she really looked. I couldn't believe it, right? I've just seen the most remarkable stories around people who ate mostly meat and incorporated some carbs and stuff here and there, and you don't have to eat only meat. I'm not coming on to this podcast saying that, but meat is really important. Right? Meat has so many nutrients. We absorb 20% of the more nutrients found in steak, like iron, for example, than in spinach, which we absorb only 2%. So yeah, we can absorb iron from spinach, but we actually absorb more iron from a piece of steak because it's more bioavailable. Our, we, our bodies are designed, evolved around eating meat. We have similar stomach acids to the acids of wolves, for example. Think about that. So what does that tell you about digesting meat? We can easily digest meat. If you ever hear somebody say, oh, no, meat's hard to digest. It just ferments in, in your intestines. It's like, that's completely wrong. Because after you eliminate the garbage, you'll find that your digestive system ramps up. It improves. And then when you eat meat you notice how good you feel and how easy it is for you to digest because you poop a lot less when you eat meat, way less, like 70% less than you did before. Why? You absorb most of it. Simply, you absorb most of it. So what I eat today, I, I try and aim for two meals a day. So for breakfast, I'll have a steak with some beef 
um, oh, sorry, I'll have a steak with bone marrow, some bone marrow and some butter and salt. That'll be my breakfast. And for dinner, I'll have two beef patties, uh, about a few eggs and with some salt, maybe a little bit more bone marrow, but that's pretty much it. I went from a ketogenic diet and I was having vegetables, fruits and nuts and meat and here and there. And that's good. I recommend that. So I'm not here to say meat only, but for me right now, I've minimized so much of that. And I've noticed the more I minimized, the better I felt. And lastly, I want to leave you with a quote from Matthew Paggio's book, The Language and Symbols of Creation in the Genesis Stories. So he says, bad food, bad food leads to a general disagreement between spirit and body called intoxication. This happens when incompatible substances become faulty body members that are unwilling or unable to express the intentions of the head. This incongruency happens when we eat foreign foods. That's what he's saying. I love that. I love that. It makes everything so clear. It makes exactly what I'm saying so freaking clear. When we eat foods like cakes and cookies and pastas, there's an incongruency because you don't feel well. You have trouble functioning. Life just becomes so much harder. But it doesn't need to if you make the right sacrifices. And that's where I'm going to leave you on this podcast episode. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I hope that this podcast resonated with you. I'm really grateful for all of your support. I mean, I couldn't do this without you guys. I mean, you know, I I love sharing this stuff because this stuff is mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing. Oh, oh yes, before I go, here are some resources to check out. I think the number one book you guys need to read is The Big Fat Surprise by Nina Teicholtz. Oh, my God. It's just, if you want to dive into the studies that manipulated culture and you as a person behind why meat is bad or saturated fat is bad... This book, man, she she used to be, I think she used to be a vegetarian. She used to be, uh, she was, she's a reporter. She's She used to eat a, a high vegetable diet. But when she started to dive into this information over, I think it took her 12 years to write this book. She dived into the reasoning behind these ideas. And man, the book she now presents us is just phenomenal. It opens your eyes to the lies and deceit of the nutrition guidelines. Everything that you've been told from your doctor, from the public, man, it's wrong. And I recommend this book. Also, um, Michelle Hearn's book. Oh my God, The Dietitian's Dilemma. Great book. I actually interviewed her on the podcast. She's fantastic. The book is fantastic. And I recommend you check out Dr. Ken Berry as well. He's a great resource. He's a YouTuber, so go look on YouTube, Dr. Ken Berry, and he'll help you. If you're having trouble with your diet journey, go over and see him. He's just phenomenal. Lastly, rise above anxiety. I'll see you next time. Brad's Powerful Anxiety Recovery Program is now available at unpluganxiety.com. The Anxiety Project Program is downloadable and puts the power of anxiety recovery in your own hands. Visit unpluganxiety.com 